Okay. So that's all. Is that all the entire Scala community in Taipei? <laughs> Half of it? Okay. Okay, good. That's good enough already. So, uh, well, welcome to this particular talk. It's about uh, developing a principal approach to programming I.O. in Scala. So, as usual, uh, let me do a brief introduction about myself. Uh, what did I do? Uh, I did a stupid thing a few years ago and I wrote some books. Uh, I would never do it again. So, <laughs> So I'm a, I'm a kind of a computing kind of nerd. So uh, some years ago, uh, I started playing with the GPUs, uh, building OpenCL uh, applications, uh, trying to illustrate what uh, GPU programming for average developers like me, how you'll be able to uh, you know become a high performance uh, computing developer yourself. So uh, English version came out, then uh, came with the Chinese version, and I worked with uh, Thomas Lockney. So Thomas right now works in uh, Nike. Uh, he heads an uh, engineering team in uh, Nike. But my intention back then was really to, you know, uh, sort of share with everybody uh, what is Aka all about. Has anyone heard of Aka? Okay. So if you are like Scala, you know, normally you know what is Aka. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, uh, a little bit more about me. I'm from Singapore. So, I can speak Chinese. I buy Kong Hokkien Wei. But, uh, but well, I should switch back to English. Uh, I think I'm more proficient in English uh, than other languages. Okay. So, I did some uh, contribution to uh, CATS, .t and stuff like that. Uh, very minor uh, contributions. Nothing to talk about. Just to let you know something more about me. Okay. So, uh, this talk is really about uh, effects, or rather the I.O. monad in Scala. So, has anyone uh, started using uh, the, you know, the cat's effect uh, libraries in your, in your work? Or as a hobby? Okay, I know Walter has it. Okay, okay so, uh, everybody else uh, doesn't really know, right? Okay, so, I'm going to try to uh, give you a taste of what the I.O. Uh, monad in uh, Scala is going to look like and how it can be possibly be applicable for you. But for that, we need to set the ground. So setting a ground basically means that, so we need to understand what is the effect, right? So for, I, I guess for functional programmers, uh, we are very particular about effects. We are very particular about, about what we mean by an effect. And actually, most, most times, what you're really thinking about is that you're thinking about side effects. So side effect can, can be literally means anything. And IO Monad in really in Scala, at least in my experience, uh, is really about controlling how these effects can be effected. So the control and basically what it means is the separation of concerns. That means you describe the computation doesn't mean that you want to execute the computation there and then when you describe it. So that's a critical thing to understand. Some people call it referential transparency. Have you uh, heard of this term? Okay, so uh, for those who haven't heard of it, referential transparency literally means if I have a computation, if I run it once, it gives me uh, the result A. If I run it again, that is still give me the result A. So it should give you the result A. That's what it means by referential transparency. Okay. Now, to understand why this is a bit of a problem, uh, we have to understand what is uh, what do you actually have at the moment. So, you probably know what this is, right? This is just print line. I just issued an, an expression, and it executes on the spot, right? I, I couldn't, I couldn't say, uh, you know, I, I, I couldn't create like uh, a value to suspend this uh, effect itself. When I created this expression, it will execute. And how about futures? So, Scala futures is not anything different from uh, Java, or well, at least not in the in the, in the core sense of the word. But the key thing here is to understand that uh, futures, yes, it is asynchronous computation by default, but it's still eager evaluation. So when you put in whatever the computation is inside a, a future, it is still going to execute eagerly. Okay, so that's a critical difference to 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 understand. Okay. 
So, what do we need? Uh, well, in functional programming, especially in, in CATS, if you are very used to uh, uh, FP style of programming, you want a couple of things. You want to understand sequencing, right? So it's like, if I say that if I have an effect in a sequence, I say that uh, printing a hello before world, then it should always print hello before world, and not the reverse. So the sequencing is very, is very important. Actually, you've already seen this in your regular Scala code that you've been doing. Uh, it's called the call, the, the uh, for comprehension. Okay. All right. So the next thing is actually stack safety. Stack safety is, uh, is very critical. It's very important uh, in uh, uh, current day programming, especially in Scala. So does anyone understand the idea of a trampoline? So, okay, so in Scala, right, especially from Scala 2.12 onwards, the trampoline is now by, by default. What that means for you Scala programmers is that without, doing, uh, without using the CATS ecosystem, uh, you have literally stack safety by default. If you, you, if you do it properly, that means that you have tail recursion. And so you literally have a TCO, tail core optimization, done for you, okay? So the... the the next thing we have to understand is about evaluation mode. So evaluation mode, right, at least uh, what this library is trying to do is to understand or uh, to provide us mechanisms for us to describe something that is lazy. That means we, you know, if, uh, in normal Scala programming, lazy would be like a thunk, right? That means a, a, a call by parameter name, call by parameter reference. So asynchronous, uh, as you know, uh, in writing Scala code, you constantly have, uh, you know, need to write a lot of asynchronous code, right? And you need to understand how this sequencing actually happens when you're writing asynchronous code. And finally, which is the most, uh, what do you call that, the most uh, uh, obvious one would be uh, strict evaluation, okay? Yeah. So how do we sort of get to know this thing, what we call an I.O. monad. So over here is an example of how, how an I.O. monad uh, sort of basically functions. It's very, very simple, but it serves to highlight a few ideas. The first thing is that you suspended, we just suspended a print line inside the I.O., right? When you suspend this, it's not executed at all. So if you contrast the code examples that you saw previously, right, there was no way that you could, uh, using current mechanisms and without reinventing the whole wheel, can you achieve this, right? So the next thing is actually when and as and when you need to execute this particular I.O. Uh, action, you need to invoke it. So what it means is that literally when you write functions like this, it stays in the memory without doing anything at all until when and when you need it. Okay. Okay. So, so what exactly is I/O? So, uh, if you read the uh, type, uh, sorry, the Cat's Effects uh, website, it basically says that the I/O values are actually pure, and they're immutable, and literally preserves uh, referential transparency. So, in essence, right? Actually, the last thing would be very helpful for you to understand is that it is a data structure that represents a description of this effectful computation. So if you have, you know, like, like us, like anyone who is a, you know, a functional programming uh, programmer per se, and you downloaded the CATS effect library, you probably would have started browsing the source code to see how this I.O. monad is actually implemented, right? So it's literally a lot of uh, type classes. Uh, actually, there are primarily only just about three type classes to illustrate uh, the three different effects which is the lazy, the strict, and the asynchronous uh, uh, computation. So these are the, uh, what you call it, the type classes basically represents the behavior uh, that, w that when you want to describe a corresponding computation, what it should look like, okay? So the next few slides all the way until the end, I'm gonna show you examples of how you can possibly uh, describe it, okay? So uh, one of these things is to uh, so don't 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 get too involved in this uh, whole uh, coding here. 
the entire uh, code base is actually uploaded into a GitHub repository, which you can download and then play on your own to to to, to sort of uh, understand what's going on. So basically, what we are doing here is actually we are describing something that is asynchronous and it is cancelable. So everyone is un so everyone understands implicit, right, in Scala, right? So let me walk through what basically what 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 you're looking at. I want to process this particular service concurrently, and I want to describe what I want to do. This is the part where I'm describing what to do. When I want to, but this is say, because it's concurrent, right, I have to handle things like callbacks, basically. So there's a type signature that basically says that there's a callback, uh, and it basically, what you do is that you use uh, the callback to send signals to the outside world, whether was it a successful computation, or was it a bad computation? The next thing is to under, this is the part where I'm actually ca calling the service to basically complete. So when they, when it's basically success, uh, I'm basically sending a signal to the callback. What's you know that basically is a successful computation. If not, if it's a failure, by indicating the left into the callback. So this is a pretty uh, standard way of uh, writing asynchronous and something. Uh, in, in, in kinds of fact. Now, the w one thing that is quite uh, interesting would be this last piece. This is what they call the cancel token. This cancel token allows the code to basically, uh, from the caller's point of view, to cancel this concurrent process. What you need to do is to handle the cancellation logic here. Okay? So, in, in when you're describing something uh, concurrent and cancelable, you basically tell it what you want to do, and in case uh, if there's something something happens during a computation, how you need to handle the cancellation. Okay. Any questions so far? I I know it, it will take some time for you to wrap up, wrap your mind around this thing, because it has something to do with the way the callback is being written. The way the asynchronous uh, type class is actually being encoded within the cat's effect. But this is the gist of, of uh, writing something that is asynchronous and you can actually cancel it. Okay. So when you run the, uh, the test code, which you will pub uh, later I will publish the, uh, the, the URL, is that you see something happening over here. I basically run, uh, I omitted some of these code, but basically there are 10 processes running concurrently and they're all cancelable. Now, what happens is that I'm basically doing a race. So when the first guy that gets, that completes the process, the cat's effect library will automatically issue a cancel to all of the other processes in that race. Okay. Now the motivation behind doing this, right, it actually started from uh, the, the creators of the project. Uh, there was a problem with the Scala Z uh, task type class in which it couldn't be cancelled. So this particular approach was actually being taken to correct that particular problem. Okay, and in Scala Z's uh, handling of the IO monad, what happens is that when, um, when you are racing, right, when many cars are racing on the on the road, the winner gets obviously the trophy, the women, the money, and etc., and the condo, or whatever it is. And the losers, what happens to the losers? In in Scala Z, uh, uh, Scala Z seven's uh, task, it is completely undefined, which means that uh, things go to hell. You would have resource leaks. You would have memory leaks. So this approach taken by the creators of the library was particularly to tackle that problem. But the approach is actually quite general. That means uh, uh, the solution is general in the sense that the cancellation logic is housed together with the asynchronous processing logic. So that everything is situated at one single location so they can understand everything. And you let the cat's effect handle all the heavy machinery. Okay, so the next thing is understanding cancelable. So, cancelable, uh, there are many, actually there are about three ways to be able to create something that is cancelable. Later I'll show you some uh, gotchas of uh, uh, things of what to avoid uh, when you're writing uh, something that is asynchronous, 
something that's concurrent, but you still want it to be cancelable. Okay? But the general idea here is that inside this uh, object, there is a uh, definition of the cancelable, uh, which basically means that in the callback, uh, tell me something, uh, whether, whether this uh, particular asynchronous process is going to succeed or is not going to be success successful, and what happens when I cancel it, which is why they call it the cancel token. Okay. So, so this is a, this is a probably a very classic example of how you can uh, build uh, cancelable concurrent and asynchronous process using the I/O monad. Okay, I, I don't know about you, but when I was when I was programming in Java, there was some parts in my uh, you know Jira task list I had to go write something like that. Beep every once every other you know uh, after waking up after sleeping for maybe a few seconds. I constantly have to, you know, something do something like that. Now, in the JDK, or uh, in any JDK, you already have a scheduled executor service, right? Typically, these are the execution context you can use to construct things like this. That means uh, you schedule for uh, schedule after uh, a particular part duration, and then you start executing that particular computation. Now, using the cat's effect, you can actually re-express this, okay? What, what is happening here is that there are actually three parts. Huh? The first part is from here to here, the second part is here, and then the result. So basically, what I'm tr trying to do is I create something that is cancelable, and I run a basically a, a, a basically a task inside this uh, process that is cancelable, and it wakes up every one every second, basically. Okay, And after that, I just keep on beeping. So this is the, the idea of the logic, and somewhere in the uh, in the main uh, uh, what you call it the main program, I basically say that okay, I start, I start the beeper, and I sleep for three seconds, and then I hit the cancel, and then I shut down the whole thing. Now, one thing the cat's effect, or rather the cat's ecosystems provide, is this idea of composition. So, do, do you know what this uh, symbol means? The star. And the right arrow. Huh? Okay. okay, so uh, what this means is that it's actually sequencing. This is, uh, this is applicative uh, sequencing. So what this means is that run this guy first, ignore the result, run this guy, ignore and run. Okay, so this is different from uh, monadic binding which is the different sim uh, symbol, which you'll see later, where we'll use the result of a previous computation. But over here, I completely ignore it. That means I just want to have the effect. The effect, huh? The key thing is the effect. The effect of sleeping for three seconds, cancelling, and shutting down the uh, execution context. So when you run this, you see that it's beeping three times, and after that, you see an issue or cancel. So this is a classical way to uh, build something that is cancelable and concurrent at the same time. Okay. So for the astute reader, you would have noticed in my code examples, in, in this particular instance, I'm using I.O. But in the previous code example, I'm using a polymorphic uh, approach. And what do I mean by that is, is this. The I.O. Uh, in when you're using uh, CAT's effect, you should think of it as a as the in interpreter of all the type of, of all the effects systems within encapsulated within the CAT's effect. What this means is that if I write this code and I call the CAT's effect I.O., that means imagine this one is being replaced by I.O., it will use the CAT's effect I.O. way of interpreting this asynchronous to process. So now, what this means is that if you if you've used Scala Z, ZIO, for example, ZIO can provide their own I.O. instance, and you can replace it here. And the code will still work, OK? But I have to admit to you, right now, they're still discussing. They're just still discussing what it means uh, by some of these laws. We'll, we'll, we'll go into that in slightly later. Okay. 
So the next thing is, uh, CATS in fact also provides facility to do uh, error handling. So, I mean, what good would the asynchronous process do? And, and we will provide all these wonderful interfaces, uh, where, but you can't really handle errors, right? So how would you, how would you handle something like that? So there's a fictitious problem which I place over here. Uh, as you see, uh, this is still the polymorphic type approach. I'm basically saying that this process is going to be asynchronous. What I'm essentially doing is that I'm sending this list of values, and I want to, it's like a par map. That means I'm mapping and then doing a uh, asynchronous uh, mapping, and then I, uh, I sort of, sort of uh, uh, try to convert all the values that is negative to a positive and then plus one. It's literally map underscore plus one. Okay, but in cat's effect, this is one way of writing it. It's not the most optimized way, but it's to illustrate the concept is that you can pass in a list of whatever the values is. You invoke this particular IO, um, what do you call IO effect, and you indicate how you wish to handle the error. So notice, uh, notice something quite important is that when you describe this guy, uh, I did some basic, basic uh, error handling here, but there's nothing elaborate. But what I want the, the, the caller to do is to handle it explicitly by saying that if you see an error when you're executing this guy, here's what you do. This is basically plus one and just, you know, uh, providing an absolute value. Once I do this, par sequence, so par sequence is like par map, it literally makes it parallelizable. So all these things execute, uh, execute concurrently and asynchronously. Okay, in this computation, I don't really care because it's not important that I sequence it, right? Okay, so the rest over here is just regular Scala code. I'm invoking the functor of the ID because these are numbers. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So one thing you need to notice about this is that this is one way uh, within CATS effect to describe a cancelable task. But you notice there is no cancel token here. What this means is that this particular way of encoding basically says that when you run this, there's no way you can cancel it. If you try to do a cancellation over here somewhere in your code, when you're invoking it, what you're going to see is that this whole process will hang. The reason is because in the, the way they're encoding it, they're expecting to see something here, the cancel token. If they don't see it, they just keep on spinning. Okay, so that's a critical thing to, to know. So uh, the next thing is really about resource management. So resource management is literally try catch finally in Java. Okay. So, but if you if you try to write try catch finally in, in Java, and try to compose them, I, I think it's a pain. Uh, that is is actually sending me into nightmares trying to compose something that is try and a catch and then there's a finally. So they, they came up with this idea about resource management to basically describe a particular data type and to constrain the data type to tell you what to do. So when you're reading something, when this is when you're reading this type signature, what is it telling you? It's telling you that there's a particular resource. I'm looking for this kind projector, and resource uh, will carry this particular type, which is called A. When I have the resource, I want to use it, I pass in this function that says, I consume the resource, which is A, and return you something else. Typically, it will be uh, an IO or something. And, but this is a critical thing. This implicit value means error handling. Okay. If you check the type class hierarchy, bracket is a way in the cat's effect, which is actually inherited from Haskell. It's a way to say, provide error handling. And if you look at the type class hierarchy, bracket actually inherits from Monad error. What that means is that it's assuming that you know how to handle the error. So this code looks simple, but it's telling you a lot of information. It's telling you that when you, when you invoke it, I expect a function, and there is a, error handling instance somewhere. I don't care what it is, but there is, there is something over there. Okay, so, so how do you make use of this? Inside the code repository, you're going to see two examples. One of them is using HTTP for S. 
uh, which is the my default most favorite the uh, purely functional Scala library to use when I'm using the web. But there's another example, which is from Akka HTTP. Akka HTTP uh, has a different uh, philosophy to uh, handling uh, HTTP requests, but nothing uh, pretty much changes. This uh, example is to illustrate how you could use resource management within CATS Effect to realize, to basically remodel uh, Akka HTTP or any other Java library that you see out there and to remodel it so that you can create resources out from it. And we've broken up, uh, broken up into three uh, portions. The first one is, I need to create an idea of a resource. So I say, I, uh, in, in the resource acquisition, I need to say, give me the how you want to do this, that means how you want to acquire the resource, and tell me how you want to release it. Okay? And over here, acquire is basically, I'm parking the entire HTTP client, which is from Akka HTTP, into a IO. I'm suspending here. Nothing is executed at this moment. Over here, I say it's unit. The reason is because if you try to close it, nothing works. The entire client just closes. Okay. So once you have this idea, you basically have this facility to say, I wrap a uh, HTTP client as a resource, and I have a way of releasing it, per se. The next thing is, now that I have a client, I want to make a request for it. Now in this code example, as you will see in the GitHub, it's literally doing uh, crawling the website. Uh, there are about six or seven websites addresses that are placed inside the, the code. And what happens is that each of these sites basically gets traversed. And I make this, uh, I basically uh, create the resource and command the client to go, uh, you know, go crawl the website. So this is what this last statement is doing. But before that, I have, to dis I have to describe what I want to do with this particular resource. So from here, uh, IO provides this from future. It basically uh, lives uh, a, 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 what you call that, a future into an IO and then processes it. And over here, flat map basically says that once, uh, once I get this client and, and I make a request to the site, you can see it over there. When I get the result, print this status. This status is, uh, is basically the HTTP code within Akka HTTP. And then if I see any error, just print error and return unit, for example. So this is a, I wouldn't say this is like the most canonical way, but this is one way that you can potentially do it. That means the key idea here is actually to wrap. is to remodel something that you think is a resource, wrap it, use it and handle errors, then after that, it's, at this point in time, it's still lazy, uh, nothing is executed. Okay, even here, it's still not executed. Remember, I.O. Uh, is just an I.O. Nothing is being done at the moment. So when you run the, the test program, which is in the repository, you will see that actually it goes to crawl the website. Okay, and this is sequential crawling, okay? Uh, in the same code example, I gave you an, another example where you can do parallel uh, crawling. What changes is this? You basically go from traverse to par traverse. Okay. And then it just works. So what I like about this is that most of the execution, if you think from an organizational point of view from the code, the function pretty much stays the same. How I want to execute it is actually outside. You only execute this later on. You never do anything to it. So from a code organizational point of view, these two methods can actually be housed in the trade or anywhere else, hidden from your users. What your users see will be something like that in the end. It just works. It's like magic. Okay. Raymond? Yeah. Uh, in the uh, request HTTP1X, that uh, I.O. from future, right? And then you need to wrap the uh, future. Yes. So shouldn't that be just I.O. parentheses instead of I.O. dot pure? Uh, yes, you can do the same thing. Right, yeah, because I.O. pure uh. means the, whatever you're wrapping to uh. the outside. Uh, correct. Good, good catch. So you should be I.O. Okay, cool. Good catch. So it could be... Uh, 
as, as what Walter said, uh, I think uh, you can try io.suspend or delay. They mean the same thing. Suspend and delay mean the same thing. Yeah, but, but what uh, Walter said was correct. Thank you. So far, is it okay for this one? Okay. Yeah. I have a question. How, uh, how do you, if you want to handle more error, error condition, mm -hmm. uh, you just need to add uh, error, error, error handle in the, uh, in the handle error with this plug. Uh, yeah. 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 But uh, in this way, you will not you, you, you will not know the, what is the error type in the return return function, yeah. the, the re, return type of this function. Mm -hmm. So, actually, if we zoom out the, the issue again, there's a problem with future. There's a, there's a chance the future can transform exceptions. If you've seen this in runtime, right? You, you thought that it was supposed to throw some, let's say, some exception A. But through some internal machinery that you unwittingly wrote, or somebody else who wrote it, it gets transformed. So in that way, uh, you can't really capture those problems uh, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Another one. Yes, yes sure. uh, uh, For the sites, yeah. sites S, yes. So, because there are many sites will be like mm -hmm. every time when I when, when I read the wrong IO and the Mac HTTP uh, next resource mm -hmm. will create a lot of HTTP instance. Uh, uh, no. For every no. Site. So as far as I know, this is like a it's like a singleton instance. Yeah. So it sh it should it should be pretty safe. Okay. Yeah. So be only a single one. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is one way to do it. I'm sure you will find more creative ways to leverage the IO monad once you start getting, uh, you know, you start playing around, you get more proficient, you you see a lot of things that I don't see. Not to worry. <laughs> okay. So the next one comes uh, one of my favorite topics. It's called concurrent modeling. So what I mean by this is that cat's effect. Huh? Even though uh, the creator says that there is no concurrency. But it does con provide some concurrency uh, constructs, right? Things like deferred, uh, MVAR, uh, what was it, semaphore, and etc. things like this, all right? So what can you potentially do with this? So when I was, uh, I started reading this paper called Concurrent Haskell by Simon Payton Jones. That was a long, long time ago. There are two data structures that is inside. One of them is called a buffered uh, channel. The other is called a skip channel. So I thought to myself, can we actually rewrite it using this approach? Can I read the source code in Haskell in the paper and translate it? Turns out I actually can. So let's walk through in the next few slides what I mean by this. A buffer channel is like an unbound, unbounded buffer. It has a read end, it has a write end. So reading and writing is completely asynchronous of one another. That's a general idea. So if you build a channel, you can keep on building it without reading a single thing. Okay. Now, in their paper, what they propose is that we can actually model this using the uh, uh, Haskell concurrency constructs, and they gave a demonstration code to illustrate. Okay. So what happened next? I took up the challenge. So I read the code uh, on the paper. And I looked at what we already have in the I.O. Uh, CAS effect. And basically, this is uh, uh, almost word for word in the paper. You can literally translate them. Okay? This is quite a powerful concept. Okay? I'm not trying to sell Haskell to any of you, huh, by the way. But I, you know, it's like uh, if there was something much easier for me to do, why would I go the hard route, right? So, but this is uh, quite an interesting challenge. So inside here, the most important thing to, to know is that there's a reader and a writer, which represents the read end and the write end. Okay. So there are a few more functions inside the GitHub repository. I encourage you to go read it. But these are the three core ones. How do I create a new one? How to create a how to read from a channel 
and how do I write the channel? Now this is a polymorphic uh, cat's effect. Okay, remember what I said about this, right? If Scala Z I O uh, is is willing, one day we'll be able to run the same code by replacing with uh, Scala Z I O. Okay, so in the new channel, uh, what I'm basically doing is that you 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 see that literally is for comprehension. Remember, cat's effect is about sequencing computations. If I see it, that it's occurring, this expression is uh, is before this guy. It should execute before this guy, right? Because remember, cat's effect. One of the core things is about managing uh, and controlling when the effects are being affected and the sequencing. So when you when you uh, read the, the paper, and then you, when I started translating the code, I found it very natural. It's very natural translation from a Haskell to Scala. In the end, then I start writing it, okay? So, let's see a demonstration. So in the end, uh, in, in that code, uh, what I did was, I wanted to do a summing. Now there's a bit of a subtlety here. What I'm doing is I'm creating a new channel. I pass in the IO. This is cat's effects IO, all right? And then I write. But if I, if I omitted the start, it will be sequential writing, right? But because I put the start, what happens is that start literally means that a fiber will be created. It's a lightweight thread. They'll be running asynchronously, okay? But I don't really care because I just want to know the sum, right? Why would I care? Sequencing is, doesn't make sense to me. So. Over here, when I do a sum, uh, when I run the I/O action, it returns me 45. It's correct, right? So if I were to, if you go back, you comment out this start, it will still give you 45, just that it's sequential. So you see, the power of this uh, cat's effect uh, is starting to dawn upon me. When I started doing concurrent modeling, I was like, oh, it's very natural. It's very natural. And I took the very long way to write this. I could have a much easier way. List of numbers, traverse, the, 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 the right channel, it will still work, right? But I wanted to illustrate an idea. The idea is that cats if I can model a concurrent data structure. And you have the option of saying whether is it sequential evaluation or asynchronous and concurrent evaluation. So that's the power here. Okay. Next one is well, which is the same, which is the inside the paper, it's called a skip channel. The skip channel, if you're in finance, <laughs> you'll be quite interesting. What it literally means is that uh, within the time buffer, I don't care how much, uh, how much data you wrote to this particular location, I just want the most recent one, right? When you're handling bits, for example, uh, and things like this, it could be quite interesting. So in the paper, they suggested there was a concurrent way to do this. Again, I did the next thing that came to my mind. Could this be possibly be modeled? Turns out you can, and this is the way to do it. There's a few more functions inside the code repository which, which you can read uh, during your own time, but basically what we're using here is nothing more than m bars. Okay, mutable variables. These are just synchronization within the concurrent data structure. And basically, like the previous one, you have a new, uh, creating a new skip channel, uh, reading from the skip channel, and then finally putting something into the skip channel. Again, this is a polymorphic code, right? Which means one day, Scala ZIO, I could potentially use it. Okay? So let's see it in action again. So uh, inside here, uh, we have the uh, same situation. Now, when you run this, it will still return you 134. Because skip channel, remember, uh, I don't care how much you read, uh, how much you wrote. But it's the most recent road that when I get it, I will always get it. So in over here, the logic is very clear. So when you're writing concurrent data structures, the expressivity of the logic is very important to you because it helps you to debug. Right? If the specification says that at, at A, even though I put it, uh, I wrote it to the channel zero and one, the channel will always contain the value one, and A will always return me one. And similarly, okay. I think we're running out of time. So the next thing I wanted to show you, which is the last few slides, is about logging with cat's effect. Okay, depending on who you ask, 
uh, you're going to have a lot of different answers. But here's my answer. So this is the classic Fibonacci sequence you'll find on the Cat's Effect uh, website. Nothing fantastic, basically says, uh, create an IO effect. OK, so if I run to the end of the, of the recursion, just return me the accumulated value. If not, keep on going. And you know, and then it stops shifting. Have you seen this thing called CS, CS shift? It basically means is that we're switching uh, context pool. OK, so it means that uh, basically at every 100 computation, I will assign another thread to continue the computation. This is what uh, Cat's effect uh, literally does. Okay, now what happens is the, the, qu the question is that how do I log each step of this thing? How do I do it? Okay, so here is my rendition. I place the right monad into it. So I d again, I, I ask myself, how easy is it uh, to really uh, place the right monad inside a a pure, fun, uh, pure uh, computation and still track each step of the uh, computation. So I decided to you know, put in uh, a writer monad, and you can see it from this uh, signature over here. This is the writer monad inside here. And if you compare the previous code and this one, you'll notice that what I basically did was the logic remains the same, except the writer monad is injected at each critical step of the computation. So do you know what this uh, symbol means? OK. The symbol means is that this one must be a monad. And when you see this, throw me the actual right, uh, the, the value that the monad is carrying inside here. So W, in this case, is basically a writer. And then over here, I basically says, this is the writer monad. And I write it. That's it. So once you understand this pattern, you keep on using it subsequently. But this is not efficient, because the reason is, do I really have to do this every single time I have a computation? This is the part where I have to give a, a big shout out to Chris Davenport. Chris Davenport created a project called log for cats He took all my pain away, basically. <laughs> He injected, uh, he wrote uh, basically the Scala logger, wrap it as a resource inside I.O., and then allow me to basically do tracing and logging. So if you contrast the two uh, different approaches, obviously uh, this implementation by Chris is definitely much, the much more pleasant one for me, because the logging is actually, I mean, first of all, it reads better, and it's literally doing logging. So when you run this on the code example later, you see the differences uh, uh, with the two approaches. And of course, we all know the inherent weaknesses when we are using the writer monad, right? It, it can potentially bomb, literally. Okay, So that's not the recommended approach. But it's my rendition to, to sort of show you and then contrast the two different styles and how you can interject things. Uh, because the cat's effect is a very ge generic abstraction, and it works very well with the cat's ecosystem. Okay, so when you start thinking like this, you start wondering, you start asking yourself questions about, can I include stuff from the cats into cats? In fact, the answer is yes. Okay, so we're down to the last three sides. Got chance. So, stack safety. Please don't do something like that. Uh, when when I went through Daniel Spivak, who is the author of the, this particular library, he, he made a point. He said, Kleisley's are, in general, are not suitable as part of uh, to be encapsulated inside an I.O. monad. And I started to wonder, what, what does he mean by that? So I went to experiment. So this Kleisley compiles, uh, basically. The Kleisley is basically uh, the generic, generic form of a monad. It takes in uh, uh, some parameter and then returns a monad. In this case, I have made it recurse itself. Uh, synthetically, based on our language, the laws of Scala, this compiles. But what, what happens? When I try to put k into an IO, and then when I invoked it, I pass in the value to, it keeps on recursing. And it bombs the stack. Okay. So Kleisley's uh, bombing the stack is a true thing. 
And because Chrysler are the generic form of reader, writer, state, uh, monads, you really should think very carefully when you start building these things. You have to think about that. So what's the reason? The reason is because the current encoding of cats is not stack safe. Maybe in the future it will. Uh, I have confidence because Scala literally eliminated a lot of these uh, uh, stack uh, safety issues by having uh, the implementing the concept of the trampoline classes. Okay. Okay. So this is quite important to know: is that cancellation? Remember, we are building asynchronous and cancel, uh, cancelable uh, processes. It assumes that you can actually cancel. And it also assumes that there's no blocking. This example uh, looks a bit, uh, it's a bit complicated, but what this, uh, what this is doing is that this is another form of the resource management. What I'm doing here is that from here to here, I'm acquiring two semaphores in some particular order, and I'm handling an error because I'm going to vomit an exception over here, and I'm going to handle an error. But that's not the, that's not the idea. The idea is actually here. Now, once this whole thing uh, completes, and it will complete, it will start running here until you hit this point. This idea is to illustrate. You see this uh, long string of composition. They are nothing more than composition of IOs, uh, monads, passing value to one another. The whole point in, in this whole little code example is, is to inform you that if you have something like this that will never finish, this computation will hang. When it hangs, this never gets executed. You literally have memory leaks. Okay. So I guess I'm out of time. Right? Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. So far, any questions on this? Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Sure. Okay. Okay. So the, probably the uh, the last one is uh, is really uh, uh, just because it compiles doesn't mean it will work. Okay. It's, it's something uh, you have to be very careful when using Cat's effect. So what I did is basically the cancellation is logic is missing here, but I issue a cancel. All right. This will hang. But this whole thing will compile. So what's the, the actual problem is actually in the encoding of uh, this asynchronous logic. Because they want to make it uh, quite uh, generic. So they allow uh, certain type classes to inherit. And some of these things are blanked out. So I hope Cat's Effect 3, which is the next version, probably will correct all these uh, seemingly simple errors. OK. So it. So in, in short, right, Cat's effect places the power of defining asynchronous, uh, concurrent, and cancelable logic into the hands of the developer. But there's still corner cases you have to watch out for. And some of these are actually uh, listed here. It's not exhaustive, uh, but I hope that it serves to highlight some parts. Okay. So the last one would be, uh, these are the list of references. This, will, this is the code repo. And uh, the Cats Effect main, main page, the tutorial page, highly recommend you go through this a couple of times. Uh, Monix, Monix FS2, uh, Lock for Cats. All right. Okay. So that's all I have. <laughs> so any questions? Do, do you have any experience about the, the performance uh, benefit from the uh, all archive, archive actually service and reflect and adapt cat effect. After adapt cat effect, what uh, performance advantage can we can we have? Oh, okay. So uh, I I can't draw a generic conclusion to that because uh, uh, in a way uh, most of the well at least most of the work we are doing is related to Apache Spark. So uh, on some level, we don't really use uh, ACA per se. Or even when uh, dragging, let's say, like a, just now the code example that you saw on ACA HTTP. It was my way of drawing a comparison. 
So I can't say whether is it performant as compared with, uh, let's say, Blaze, which is in HGPS, HGP4S versus Akka HGP. But the CATS effect report story comes with uh, good benchmarks. So the benchmark codes you can literally run on your machine uh, when you have the time. And as far as I know, you know people uh, that, um, that the performance is good. One of the reasons is because the uh, tail recursion is no longer an important issue, and the I/O loop with, within uh, we call it within the uh, cat's effect is actually quite quite good, and it takes care of moving uh, variables like uh, uh, some of these things related to the track local, and it helps you to mask that away, so you don't really have to care about that. Yeah, uh, any other questions? <laughs> I just keep forgetting I have to speak into the mic. <laughs> I think I might just add uh, the difference. Uh, to me, the difference between Cat's Effect and something like Akka is it's easier to model how your program uh, should behave using Cat's Effect. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't really worry about all the machinery because in Akka you have to keep consciously thinking about the actors and stuff like that. Whereas here it's all basically, in, you know, if you have like a poor uh, comprehension. Uh, you know, you have you can create sort of like execution boundaries with context shifts, and, and then you can also pass uh, like certain uh, say um, what do you call it uh, uh, method task, uh, then run it in parallel. It's basically a bunch of one-liners compared to something like actors. So performance-wise, it's easier for you to reason, and then make it easier to actually uh, provide improvements. Whereas I guess with Akka, it uh, takes a lot more effort uh, to actually grasp the whole uh, application and then it's also harder to create improvements in that. Any other questions? Okay then, uh, thank you very much.